and welcome to the Law of Positivism podcast. I'm your host, Shireen, and I'm the creator of Law of Positivism. I'm here to help you on your spiritual and healing journey. I am a certified yoga and meditation teacher, a student of Chinese medicine, a doula, a Reiki practitioner, and a passionate, highly sensitive person. I want to use my knowledge to channel information and messages for you to grow on all levels. Hi, and welcome to this week's episode. I'm very grateful that you're here, and I'm so excited for this week's episode. I had the amazing Sufi Ertur as my guest. She's a doula, spiritual medium, and intuitive that help others on their path to connect with their spirit babies, babies, soul cartography, uh, intu- intuitive consultations, and her intention is to lead you back to wonder, joy, and balance. And in this episode, we talk about what it means to be a trans medium. Uh, we talk about spirit baby communication and how she connects with babies that are not born yet. And we talk about sacred soul contracts, her work as a doula, about healing, about spiritual guides, and intuition. And this episode is really the first episode I'm recording after the summer. I feel like the summer was really calm and relaxing, something that I truly needed. I hope you have enjoyed your summer and taken advantage of the, some peace and quiet, maybe being in nature and just connecting back to yourself. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm really grateful for all of you who leave reviews on iTunes. It really helps the podcast spread and for others to find it, those that are on their spiritual and healing path. So if you do share a review and rating on iTunes, I want to thank you with the Oracle card reading. So always screenshot and send it to me so I can give you an oracle card reading that is personal to you and enjoy this week's episode hi sufi welcome to the podcast Mm. hello hello thank you i'm so happy to be here i'm so grateful that you're here and i always start by asking how do you stay mindful and present in your life Well, I make sure every morning before I leave my bed to put my feet on the ground and I do a grounding meditation and connect in with the earth. And then I connect in with source, highest source universe, and really come back to neutral, as I like to say, uh, letting go of that which belongs to others, uh, letting go of hysteria, news, Mm -hmm. um, any sort of ideas, basic meditation with an added grounding element. Mm, That's Every morning I have to do it. It keeps me centered and sane. Sounds very beautiful and so important too. And I'm really excited to have you here. I've been really... I'm so happy that I found you and I'm so fascinated with your work and all that you do. And I think it would be nice if you could share with the listeners who you are and what you do. Oh, sure. Thank you. Yes. So I became a doula in 2001 and an assistant midwife. And I was certain that I wanted to be a midwife, and uh, I've been working with babies for over 20 years now, Mm -hmm. and I started to notice um, a lot going on in the birth room and a lot going on postpartum with babies and mothers that I had never heard people really talk about before. And I was hearing messages and information that there was no way I could have known 
um, but that serve to help support my clients. And a lot of times in birth, you're breathing. And at the time, I didn't realize I was a trans medium. I just wanted to be a midwife. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had no interest in doing anything psychic or mediumistic at all. Um, I just wanted to serve women in birth. But when you're breathing and carrying on in birth, um, messages started to come in. And even during the labor, the messages I was getting for my clients was helping them with their labor. Uh, postpartum, it was helping moms navigate sleep issues with their babies. And I just started to share those. Mm. And then later, I sought out mentorship uh, so I could do this responsibly and um, with knowledge. Yeah. Mm. That's so beautiful. I'm also a doula, so it's really special <laughs> to be uh, in a space of birth because it is very like the frequency is so so beautiful and uh, it can really open up so much uh, yeah. within everyone who's in the room so it's a really beautiful experience and i'm really so it's really interesting so, because you're a trans medium as well maybe you can explain to the listeners what that is so a trans medium is a little different than a regular medium mm -hmm. or standard medium. There are many types of mediums. A trans medium, um, I can go throughout my day and not hear, see, or feel any spirits around me. Mm -hmm. But the moment I focus my attention and I go into sort of a deep trance or deep meditation, then mm -hmm. a window or like a movie screen opens up and then I receive and see spirit all around me and mm -hmm. receive information. I hear, see, feel information. Mm -hmm. So um, trans, a famous trance medium was Edgar Cayce. Mm -hmm. uh, they would call him the sleeping medium. I don't have to go to sleep to get my information, but I certainly have to take a few moments before entering the reading space to center myself and go into a self-hypnosis, which then opens my ability. And is there, you, do you have certain steps to get into that? Or is it also different for all trans mediums, how they get into that state? Well, great question, because every medium is individual. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so important. I'm so passionate about young mediums and that they end up with a good teacher and in a good place because what's hardest is if mediums train with another medium that wants them to work like they do. Mm. Uh, so I had a wonderful mentor and she taught me always to learn my own abilities first and to understand my own gifts and how I worked as a system while observing other mediums. Mm. So I learned that, um, I needed certain, uh, not needed, but I breathing was huge for me. And mm -hmm. she also would observe me working and she would point out things that would serve my work and process. Mm. So there is a definite uh, system that I, uh, uh, sort of a deep meditation that I go through and it's the same every time to open up the door. Mm. And, did did that come to you naturally? How did you discover that you had this uh, this ability? Well, it was it, you know I've spoken about it before mm. at being at the birth, a very profound birth for me. Um, but as a child, I always had experiences. I have a lot of psychics and mediums in my family, mm. but I. I wanted to be a midwife. I didn't want to deal with that. So I mm -hmm. always kind of shut it off. And it wasn't till this birth and then having my own child that everything was cracked wide open. And it was this lovely client of mine um, at her birth. It was a very long birth. And we were breathing and we were about to transfer her to the hospital from her home. Mm -hmm. And the midwives had left the room and I was an assistant midwife. So I stayed there with her 
and I was overwhelmed with the presence of her grandmother. And her grandmother kept pressing me to give her granddaughter a message. And I was saying to my client, I'm so sorry, I don't do this. But if I don't give you this message, I feel like your grandmother won't leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And um, I just told her what I described her grandmother. I asked permission. I said, do you want to hear from her? She started crying. She said, my grandmother died a year ago. She raised me. I want to hear from her. And this poor woman had been pushing for three hours. We're in the bathtub. She's trying to, she's dealing with her contractions. And I give her the message. Um, and her grandmother said, your hands in mine always. And my client stood up, screamed, and crowning. Yeah. And the midwives rushed in and helped deliver the baby. And I just thought, wow, that was strange. Okay, you know, great. Yay, we, she had her baby at home. Super. I ran into this client a year later at a farmer's market. And she said, please tell me you're a medium now. And I said, no, no, I'm going to be a midwife. She goes, no, that changed my life. My grandmother always said that to me, what you told me in the birth room. And you described her perfectly. And it would be a shame if you did not use this gift. And she was so passionate about it that I didn't feel I could ignore it anymore. But I didn't know where to go. This is Los Angeles. There are a lot of crazy people who take advantage of students who want to learn this sort of work. And I just wasn't going to go find some random teacher. So I asked my therapist if she knew of anybody, and she wouldn't give me any information because she didn't feel it was her place. Mm -hmm. But a few months later, I had a dream, and I dreamt of my mentor, and I described her. I went back to my therapist, and I said, look, I've had a dream. This is what she looks like. You know her. All your people know her, and you all see her. I would like her number, please. Mm -hmm. And my therapist went white, mm -hmm. and she wrote the number down and gave me the number. So that's how I found my mentor. And she was uh she comes to Beverly Hills once once a month. And uh I trained with her for seven years, seeing her when twice in a week when she would visit that once a month. Whoa. You can't Google her, you can't find her. So I really mm. was spirit led. She was the most amazing teacher. Because when I was done, most mediums uh, train for or mentor with someone for seven to ten years. Mm. Most working mediums today, you'll find out they are mentored by someone for seven to ten years. So when I was done with my seven-year mentorship, um, I did take classes with other teachers. And I couldn't believe how well-trained I had been. And... Um, because she kind of kept me in a bubble a little bit. She really wanted me to focus on who I was and my abilities and not focus on so much outside of me because she felt it was a distraction. It would be better for me to learn me. Mm. So then I worked with her and she gave me all the tools. And at first I wasn't clear that I was truly a medium or that I could truly do it. But with her guidance... We would sit in the room and she would guide me and say, go here, do this. Do you see that? She could see what I could see. Yeah. And it was the best. She was the best teacher. That is so amazing. And it sounds like you're truly guided into what you're supposed to do. And you listen to that because I think sometimes we get some small messages or signals but we're ignoring it but sometimes you can't ignore it it's so clear and you have to like trust it so I think it's really a beautiful story and uh, and your path sounds really uh, amazing in that way and life changes all the time so th things lead to another thing and then we like discover that we because i think also just learning new things is so important because otherwise we start feeling stagnated or stuck and um 
I think also with these abilities as you have, it's it's really um, it's it's I think it's quite rare nowadays. Maybe it wasn't as rare before when we were more connected and and in t- listening to our intuition. But it's so when when someone has a gift like that, it's really. Um, it's there for a purpose and most people want to help others and at the same time they grow on the path as well and I think it's interesting to what what do you think was the important steps into becoming um, the medium that you are like in those years of mentorship and training what do you think was the most important for you to trust your abilities? Well, I always tell young mediums that the the training of them, no one needs to train a medium to do what they do. Most of the training is to teach you how to deal with human beings who are going to come to you for information. <laughs> mm. And then most of the training is believing what you're seeing and understanding uh a requirement my teacher made of me is that I had to stay in therapy while she trained me. She said, the more you understand your problems, your issues, the more you understand what belongs to you, the clearer you're going to be in a reading space. When information comes in, you'll understand that, oh, this is a message about my client. This is not my stuff. Mm. So that was important. The first thing my teacher said to me on our first day was, uh, stay in your own neighborhood. A lot of mediums worry about Hollywood movie stuff, like you see possession and evil and, oh my gosh, I can't do this because what if I become possessed or I something bad happens? And so I get that question a lot from young mediums, like, oh, isn't it dangerous? Isn't it this? No. Mm. No, that's a lot of movie stuff. Now, what my mentor meant by staying in my own neighborhood, she was absolutely correct. Where human beings in general get in trouble is when they start to play with things that they shouldn't be playing with, like Ouija board. Uh, Black magic, voodoo, any sort of belief system that's not culturally appropriate for them, first of all. Uh, Ouija board's not a game. It's It was a very serious spiritual tool. Mm. So that's what my teacher meant. Like, I was a very curious media, medium. I wanted to go out into the world and try 50 things. Mm. And she says, you always have to ask permission Connect in with your guides. I had a very serious team of guides in the beginning. Mm. They're still there, but I work with them differently now. Mm. But in the beginning, I had a lot of uh, monitors and I was guided and I could always know if I was supposed to engage or explore something by asking permission first and checking in with my own body system. If it was no, I would feel it in my body. If it was yes, I would feel it in my body. And it was subtle, but my teacher taught me to use that tool to make sure I stay in my own neighborhood. And uh, we are so divinely protected. We have free will. It's We only get into trouble if we start to... Um, you know, uh, dr- drugs and hallucinogens can be tricky. Mm. Every professional medium I know, none of them do hallucinogens. Mm. So that's another piece where that's not staying in your own neighborhood. And I love hallucinogens. When I was younger, I loved mushrooms. I loved hallucinogens. Mm. But I cannot do pot. I cannot do hallucinogens. Um, and the explanation I got from my people was that while on a hallucinogen as a medium, um, we have the ability to open and close a a special door. But while you're on any sort of ayahuasca, any hallucinogen, that door is kind of jammed open and not by you. You don't have the controls while you're on that substance. So these are just some things that I, I learned. 
And again, this is me. This is my journey. It Maybe there are mediums out there who can do hallucinogens. I don't know. But for my journey and for most of the professional mediums I know, none of them will touch hallucinogens as a working medium. Mm. That's very interesting because this it's becoming more and more, more popular, I think, for people... I think especially for those who feel, because uh, for us that have experienced a lot of things in our lives where we have seen things that are unseen uh, by the uh, physical eyes, um, it's it's like we when we allow that door to open, it happens and we get these these messages and visions, but. I think there's a curiosity behind it and people maybe don't trust that they have that ability in themselves because I think a, lo- a lot of people that do uh, these uh, ayahuasca, it, 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 part, partially people are doing it for healing, um, but also to to discover this other world uh, that that they feel that they're not tapping into. But when we're dreaming, we're tapping into that. So, I mean, it's available to everyone. But um, yeah, I, I, I resonate with that because I've always felt like I don't want any, um, w- when I've been contemplating it, it feels like it would hinder my own abilities in some way. But I maybe that's not true for everyone. Maybe for some people it, it really works and opens up, but yeah, it's interesting that you yeah. you you put it like that. And I think that's for everything that stimulates. I think when when because when you are sensitive, also all types of things you put into your bo- body, like everything from substances to food to uh, what you watch, what you listen to, you're so sensitive. So. It's like it it can become overwhelming if if you're not like really, um, yeah, really specific with and intentional with what you're putting in. Yes, and I want to be clear. I I so value ayahuasca mm-hmm. in its culture. I so value plant medicine, and for many people, plant medicine is a great healer. Yeah. I'm not against plant medicine at all Mm -hmm. but for any medium who chooses to work with people it just can't be a a constant use of it while working with people Mm -hmm. now um i i know for sure plant medicine has introduced people to their gift Mm -hmm. i so i think that's beautiful but to continue to use it in a way to keep seeing. So now I am leading journeys without substance, mm. individual one-on-one journeys with people to show them you don't need plant medicine you, for my sensitives, for, my, for the ones I'm mentoring. You don't need plant medicine. You can journey without it. I can help you get into this space where you can see visions mm. and feel hear and see in the way you would being on mushrooms or being on sassafras or ayahuasca. Mm. And that's the goal of, in a lot of shamanism, the goal is not to rely on it. In Peru, it used to be the shamans would take the ayahuasca and give the messages to the people. Mm. It's only recently that the, in the, the, when the Westerners started to go down to experience it, that the Westerners began to take it with yeah. the shaman. So mm-hmm. that's a reversal. Um, and most shamanism, uh, I love Omega Institute on the East Coast, and they have, a, um, they have a few courses there on shamanism. And those shamans will talk to you about plant medicine as an introduction to show you what you can do, and then you take it from there. It's just to show you that it's possible to do it without yeah. relying on anything. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. I think it's it can open up uh, the minds of people, especially if if you're not already experiencing things. It can really like open up and under like understanding what others might be experiencing without the substances. Because I think a lot of people just 
want to experience before they believe right it's it's really hard sure. to explain to someone what it, it it's it, it's some experiences has to be experienced you can't you can listen to it but you don't understand it until you're you're in there so yeah definitely i mean the all of nature is medicine uh yeah so i mean just a simple thing like tea or like we don't think about it as medicine or as something that that has resonance with our body but but it does so everything from earth has a, a purpose and we just have to be very um yeah intentional and also understanding why like why are we needing or doing something but it's the same thing with everything so yeah. it's interesting and also as you said for me a lot of visions that i got has been just in uh, shamanic drum circles where we just lay down and and get guided into like meeting spirit guides or going into the earth or going up so uh, you can get a lot of visions and the only thing that can stop you is if you think too much, which yes. most people do. But when you release the thinking and you just trust what you're seeing, then then it just comes to you. And, and people get surprised what they see and what they hear from that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you also, because you talked about spirit guides. Um, how did you how did you start connecting with your guide or guides in, in your journey? Yes. So uh, for a long time, I, I'd say about seven years, I had a sense of someone with me. Mm. And, but I ignored it because I was trying to ignore it all. <laughs> and um, again, with my mentor, uh, my uh, second session with her, she introduced me to my guides and um, she, we would do a grounding exercise first. She would call it running the energy and I would run my energy and ground down. And then um, we would practice uh, me seeing and understanding my guides and communicating. Mm -hmm. And so I would see them in my, with my inner eye and uh I would make a time every week to meet with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's interesting is in the beginning, I personalized all my guides. I, they had names, mm -hmm. they had personalities, and they did. But what's interesting, and a lot of mediums after a time have said this to me, um, now I, I work with them as a team. I, I do have some of my favorite guides uh, mm -hmm. that I do connect in with personally, um, like my master guide. I'm, he's always with me and I can, I can connect with him. Um, but the rest of my team, cause in the beginning I had like eight guides. Now I just call in my team. I don't have to visualize them, connect with them individually. Before I work, I set my intention. I call in my team. And for me, in my work, my team has changed a lot. Uh, I actually recently had to adjust because I have a new member to teach me something else. Mm. So every guide has an attribute. And uh, recently, I've had a medical guide uh, come help me because I, I do I talk to women a lot about fertility and with spirit babies. I have different guides for that. Or if someone is asking me to reach their loved one on the other side, I have different guides for that. But what I'm saying is in the beginning, I was fascinated by the individuality of my guides. Now I feel like I'm a team member with my guides and we work as a team. And when I go to work, I feel their presence as a whole, not so much in this individual manner. Mm. Yeah. So my mentor uh, helped guide me and show me who was there. And once she did, I was like, oh, yeah, that car accident I had in my 20s, that was James talking to me from the back seat, telling me not to push the brake. 
there was no one in my back seat, but I heard the voice as my car was spinning. Don't push the brake. Don't push the brake. And if I had pushed the brake, I would have flipped my car. And the tow truck driver said, I don't know how you survive this. Most people flip and they end up in the ditch. And I knew that was James. James is my master guide. And she went in my session with my mentor. She said, I have a gentleman here. He looks like this. He calls himself James. Hmm. I I knew him. I was Mm -hmm. like, oh. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, when I was 12 on the boat, he spoke to me. I was on a boat reading a book. I was getting into a trance because of the sound of the waves hitting the boat. Mm -hmm. And he was giving me messages. I thought it was the ocean. It was James. (laughs) (laughs) That's beautiful. So. And and how do you distinguish, because if you had that sense that someone was with you, but it's also sometimes you have a sense that, or you think that what you're feeling is maybe a loved one that has passed away, so it's not a guide. Like, how would one distinguish between those two? It's a good question. Uh, if it's my guide, it's like um, if my energy system was an apartment building, If it's a loved one, we're on the third floor at my heart area. If it's my guides, we're on the sixth or seventh floor. Mm -hmm. If it's my, um, my higher guides, because I have my team, but then I have three higher guides, that's the 10th floor. I don't hear from them very often, Mm -hmm. but, um, when I do hear from them, uh, it's pretty serious and I have to pay attention. Mm -hmm. So it's to me, every medium is different, but for me, it's a location in my auric field. And the best way I can describe that is like a building. Mm -hmm. So first, second, third, lower elementals. So Mm -hmm. I can sense earth elementals, earth Mm -hmm. energies. That's first, second floor. So like that. Mm -hmm. And then also I can Mm -hmm. see, I can see clairvoyantly. So uh, the way I see my guides is different than the way I see someone's loved one. Mm. Yeah. My guide will be right in front of me at my third eye level. Someone's loved one comes in on my right. Mm -hmm. And do you also connect and see other people's guides like your mentor did see yours? Yes. Mm. Yes. And And I share that. Uh, my favorite, though, is to inspire my students to uh, see what they already know. So I will guide them, and I I try not to tell them what I'm seeing. I just confirm what they're seeing. Mm. And I love that because, you know, I really want it to be real for them. Yeah. I don't want to just give them the information and... I want to see what they come up with. Like when women call me for spirit baby readings Mm -hmm. and they so often, um, when I tell them what I sense and see, they'll so often say to me, I knew it. I felt that too. I Mm -hmm. knew it. Most young mediums too will say that. I knew it. I knew that that guide reached out to me. Mm -hmm. So I love that discovery. Yeah. I like to inspire that. Yeah, that's really powerful. And we can get in. Maybe the listeners don't know what the spirit baby is. And maybe you can describe that and, and how you work. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit new. And mm-hmm. um, a lot of mediums um, are just, well, I'll start with the book. There was a yeah. book written by a medium in England, mm-hmm. a wonderful medium. Mr. Um, McCutcheon, uh, Walter, yeah. Walter, Walter, mm. he wrote Spirit Babies and he found in his readings in mediumship that he was getting information um, from babies or souls that hadn't been born yet. And um, it's some mediums don't believe in it. Uh, some of the old school mediums are still investigating it. Um, I'm actually connected with Mavis Patilla, 
who I adore. She's a wonderful medium from England. And I shared this with her. So a lot of mediums haven't heard of it. But what happens is um, it depends on your belief system. But I do believe in soul contracts. Mm -hmm. And I believe that certain souls sign up to be our children. And in a reading, I connect in with uh, my client. And then I welcome in any children or soul children that might be around. And I share my information about those spirits or that soul with her. And we'll get lovely validations because that soul will tell me things um, often with the help of a loved one on the other side. So it's mediumship in that there is often a loved one that's escorting the baby soul in as well. So grandmother or grandfather. And then they give me information about my client's life or maybe rituals the clients did to bring in that baby or problems or issues they're having. Um, the, I never know what they're going to bring up, but it's lovely and women find it so healing. Uh, one mm -hmm. of my favorite readings recently uh, was a 42-year-old woman. She had her first two children by IVF. And she was 42, and she was calling me for mediumistic reading and to read her current children, because I can also uh, read babies and mm. give moms information of how to deal with this problem or that problem with their child. I connect in with their children's higher self mm. and teach mothers how to do that as well. But during this reading, I said, you need to be very careful because if you don't want a third child, there's a third child waiting. Mm. And if you don't want a third child, you know, be clear and use your contraception. Mm. She said, that's, that's impossible. I had IVF with my first two kids. I'm 42 years old. I said, well, I feel like you're going to be pregnant in three months. Mm. And I don't often offer that because I hate to do any sort of prediction because if it doesn't work and there are so many moving parts to fertility I just don't want to give false hope but it was so strong with me I had to give her that information sure enough three months later she connects with me you'll never believe this she said I'm pregnant with her third child no help no IVF 42 years old wow so that message was so clear to you in that it moment. It was very clear. Mm, that's amazing. So that actually also validates everything that you do. Like that it's really the babies that you're communicating with. And, and regarding the soul contract, like, is, so in, in that perspective, it would be that the the mom and dad or mom and mom or dad and dad, they have a contract with this spirit, right? Before yes. it is born. Yes. And, and from your perspective, when did that soul contract start? Like, is it from a past life or is it in this life they get connected in some way? Oh gosh. It's, it's different for everyone, and mm. I, I, I don't even pretend to know what the universe is up to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I could never. I don't know everything, mm. but um, it is a sense. There's a good book called Sacred Contracts by Carolyn Mace, mm. and she talks about the contracts we make, the soul contracts we make. So um, that book would be a great book for your listeners to read if they're interested in soul yeah. agreements and soul contracts. Carolyn Mace, M-Y-S-S. -S. Mm. Uh, but my uh, spirit babies will come in with past life aspects. Uh, I do believe in past lives. I think the most important lifetime is the one we're in right now. Mm. But the way I feel around past life is that our souls are huge, like a diamond with many facets. And if you imagine, each facet is a lifetime. So you and I are speaking right now, and we're in this lifetime, but there's another facet 
of my diamond, my large soul, experiencing a life in Africa right now. Hmm. And spirit, my other facet of my diamond is experiencing a lifetime in Tibet. Hmm. I'm not just here. I'm in many places at once. That's how I, it's very complicated if, if, if you read any books, from, um, Tibetan books about past lives, um, it's, it's more complicated. Karma and past lives has been really watered down in our Western system. So it's, it's very complicated and it's very involved. But when I share past life aspects with mothers-to-be, they get so excited because it's usually something they've felt an affinity toward. Mm. Like, oh, I've always loved Scotland. Mm. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe you're talking about Scotland right now. I feel I've always had past lives in Scotland. Something happens to me when I visit Scotland. I, they share, or any country in the world, wherever you feel really drawn to, chances are you've had a, a few lifetimes there to experience the nature or energy of that land. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, and I, I really... Um, yeah, I also have this uh, um, belief that there is there's always a purpose. Like the parents we have, we've kind of chosen each other to learn from each other. And there, it can be a lot of challenges. It can be a lot of growth in that. So I think it's really beautiful that you can tap into that and help uh, couples and women to to connect like that. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and I had another thought um, just regarding like the higher self, because that's something that I also write and speak about. Like if, if, if s- some listeners don't know, like the difference between the higher self and the soul, like how would you describe it in your own way? I'll use an example of... There's another great book called Talking to Babies yeah. by Miriam Seger, S-C-E-J-E-R. Uh, she was a psychologist, worked in the NICU, um, intensive care in a Paris hospital, and decreased their infant mortality rate by half just by talking to babies. Mm-hmm. This, is, this has been documented. So what she was doing is... People are like, oh, how can you talk to babies? They don't understand. Uh, It's not that. What people are doing, but maybe they haven't been told, is you're speaking to that baby's higher self that knows all. You're Mm. speaking to that baby's soul self. So I had another reading a couple weeks ago. Baby wasn't sleeping. There were issues about the birth. Um, Very traumatic birth really tough NICU stay. And I asked the mother, did you explain, did you talk to your baby about the experience and tell your baby it's not going to happen again? The mm-hmm. baby had to have surgery and was put to sleep. And um, after the surgery, the baby just wouldn't sleep. And I said, you need to explain to your baby's higher self that it's not, that surgery is done. It's not going to happen again. And your body is not going to be put to sleep against its will again. Mm. She did that. They had the best night's sleep that night. Wow. She said, I could feel my baby listening to me. The baby was three months old. Mm. She's like, I could feel him understand me. He was looking at us. And then he slept longer than he Mm. had ever slept before. So there is an understanding, not just with babies, with animals, I've worked with horses a lot. Mm. Horses as well. Any Anyone who's worked with horses long enough, it's the same element. Animals and children don't understand our words maybe, but they understand our feelings, our emotionality. Mm. So if I have a mother who's having a lot of anxiety, had a terrible birth, a really tough birth, and she's still grieving but trying to hide those feelings from her baby... Nothing makes an animal or a human being more nervous than to feel a 
another human being hiding emotion because that is an energy of predator or uh, no, they, you want to share, you want to tell your babies, even your toddlers, but as children get older, you don't want to talk to them directly so much. You want to call in their higher self. Mm -hmm. So a higher self is, uh, we are living our day to day, but there's a part of us, especially in meditation that we plug into that is, um, like plugging into the main frame of our big soul the guiding force of our big soul self that's ageless, that's eternal. Mm. That's the higher self. So sometimes I'll tell moms of six, seven, eight-year-olds if they're having issues, when your child is asleep, go to the other room, call out your child's higher self and talk to them like an adult because the soul self, a lot of mediums will tell you we're th always 30 years old on the other side. <laughs> mm. which I think is funny. But um, I have women talk to their children as another 30-year-old person across from them mm. and say, look, today was a tough day. I'm not happy with this. This doesn't work for me. I need this. And she goes, well, how is this going to work? I said, because it smooths your energy. And the next day, our children are so plugged into us. The next day, your children will feel your energy has shifted because you got out what you needed to say. That's why therapy works for some, mm. because we need to speak as human beings. And when we speak and express ourselves, our energy system shifts and animals and children feel that acutely. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And when, when we're just, when we're dreaming, uh, because I'm thinking about what you said about the like being in different places in one and the same time right so mm. like when you dream it feels like uh, at least i feel like i'm like living other lives in the dreams and and yeah. visiting different amazing places and and experiencing things so is uh, which is is that also could could the dreams also be like parallel lives that we're dreaming that we're tapping into oh definitely but the way you'll know it is it's going to feel different mm. qualitatively i know i've been on the astral plane working with my guides or talking to people on the astral plane yeah um which my teacher would not let me even venture I know a lot of people are interested in astral projection. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it's something you really should play with for a good three years in <laughs> mm -hmm. to training. Mm -hmm. You're in mediumship. But um, in dream state, it's very safe. And we're always leaving our bodies to go to different areas for learning in the astral plane. But it's fun to play with the quality of your dreams. Because some dreams are just the psyche working things out. And then some dreams are teaching dreams. Some dreams are your loved ones coming to say hello. Those are very real. If you mm -hmm. dream of your loved one who's passed on, that's not just a dream. That is a visitation from your loved one. Mm -hmm. So there are different qualities to dreaming. And it's really fun to play with and find out every day you dream, keep a dream journal. And like the building I mentioned, oh, that was a first floor dream. Oh, boy, I had a guided dream. That was a seventh floor dream. You know, energetically in your body, where did you feel the dreaming and start to name it? That can make it really rich for yourselves. Mm. And I love being on the astral. I love it. it it's so magical. And um, if you have a good mentor who can guide you and work with you, um, it's the best. It's the wow. best. What is the one, most? Yeah. Hmm, yeah. Go ahead. No, I, maybe you were just answering the question, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, uh, there's a really good teacher that does astral work, uh, and he is virtual now. So his mm -hmm. name is Michael Tamura, T A M U R A. He used to be the head of the S Berkeley Psychic Institute. Mm -hmm. And one of my best led astral experiences was with his, his, um, his workshop. And he's very, he's very interesting. Michael mm. com. 
Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I would trust him to lead. He'll lead whole groups. He took us to the Akashic Records. Wow. And it was very interesting. Um, and I felt very safe. And he, he knows what he's doing. So. Yeah, because, I mean, on the astral plane, you can discover, like, new worlds and new entities. Have, what is the most yeah. amazing thing you've <laughs> experienced in that, or most, like, surprising? What was lovely in this tour of, mm -hmm. with Michael Tamura, and there were about 10 of us in the class. So we were in a class together. Uh, we went into deep meditation and grounding and he led us to the astral plane and we met in one area and then he led us into the akashic records he's like we must stay together and just start to take in your surroundings don't touch anything don't go anywhere else stay with the group mm -hmm. and so we went on this whole journey with him then when we were done and we came back into the room what was fascinating because sometimes I can be skeptical, which in some ways I think is what makes me a good medium, is um, I want it to, because when I get a good message, when I get those good validations and there's no other way I could have gotten it, that's the magic. Mm -hmm. So I want it really, I want good validations. Yeah. But anyway, in the group, we all had basically the same visuals and same experience. Mm -hmm. So it was amazing to travel, 10 of us together, with his lead to the astral plane, go through the Akashic Records, see what it looked like to us. And most of us had the same experience. Hmm. And that was fascinating to me because I thought, oh, everybody's going to think it or see something different. Yeah. But there were definitely key points that was fascinating. Yeah, that's really affirming everything for you then when you when you have that experience and so many people mm -hmm. can validate it. That's so yeah. amazing. I'm so uh, grateful for everything that you've shared. I could go on and on, but maybe you want to share with the listeners like the work that you do, like how can they connect with you and what do you offer? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, so... um Along with Spirit Baby and mediumship, I do something called soul cartography. Yeah. So you receive a reading from me, and then I create a piece of art based on that reading, which is like a mandala of you mm. um, to help bring forward your hopes, your dreams, whatever came up in the reading that will lift your spirit and your life station. And that's on Instagram at soul underscore cartography mm. and um, then of course there's spirit baby readings yeah. and that's at spirit baby whisperer on instagram yeah and then i'm at joynavigation.com my website mm. and then my favorite thing absolute favorite work right now is really connecting people with their loved ones who've passed on mm. and bringing information and validations that their loved ones are still thriving, they are fine, they're growing. And um, then my next favorite thing right now are these uh, guided sessions, uh, journeying to meet your guides, mm. exploring your own gifts. So we go into meditation together, and this is through the phone or Skype. Mm. And I lead you on a journey to meet your guides and to explore your own gifts and receive messages. Hmm. Yeah, I will. Thank you. I will share all of your links in the show notes. <laughs> it's a lot, I know. <laughs> no, but it's it's great. So people can just easily find you and your everything that you do. And do you have anything else you would like to share? Oh, gosh, no, this has been lovely. Thank mm. you. Thank you for this time. Yeah, thank you for joining. I'm so happy. I'm sending you so much love. And thank you so much for being here today. Ah, oh, you're very welcome. And stay safe and well. Yes. Thank you so much for listening. 
I hope you're as inspired as I was when I talked to Sufi. I think she is so beautiful in her energy. Her wisdom is so grand and I'm just so blessed to have connected with her. So if you want any type of consultation or reading with Sufi, you can find the links here in the show notes for her website and Instagrams. You can just click on those and read more about her. And please let me know any feedback or input that you have on the podcast so I can create more episodes that inspire you and help you on your journey. So let's just take a deep breath in together, in through the nose. And just exhale it out through the mouth. Namaste. Thank you.